time, we're going to go there for the next few moments. If you'll please turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 9. Acts chapter number 9, and we're going to look at verses 22 to 25. Acts chapter number 9, verses 22 to 25. And if you'll just follow along with me, please, and we'll read verse 25 together out loud, shall we? Acts chapter number 22 to 25. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him, but their laying await was known of Saul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Together, then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this precious passage of Scripture. Lord, we thank you for the life testimony of those within. And Lord, here is an event that you want us to see and to learn from. And Lord, we pray that the Spirit of God would bury these truths in our hearts and that as we leave, Christ would be glorified in our desires, in our actions, and in our obedience to your word, we pray. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Well, some of you may have heard of the missionary William Carey. Uh, he went to India, one of the first missionaries, or the first missionary from England, sent to the foreign field. And as he was uh, visiting churches, as he was uh, seeking to uh, raise awareness about the need of foreign missions, he used this little illustration. He said, you know, I feel like in India as if there's a man crying out from the bottom of a dark well. And he said, I'm willing to go down into the well to save the man, but I need some people up top to hold the rope for me while I go down. And in the end, that's what happened. William Carey went to India to serve the Lord as a missionary and uh, and the Lord used him mightily. And then also there were some people who stayed back in, in, uh, in England, praying for William Carey, uh, raising support for William Carey, so that he could go to do what God had called him to do. Now, since that day, the way we do missions has changed quite a bit. But one thing hasn't changed. And that's what the scriptures tell us in Romans chapter 10. For how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they preach except they be sent now if you remember anything from the message this morning is that those who go and those who send are part of the same team amen missions work is teamwork and uh, this morning we're going to see that through this unique passage of scripture there are the goers and there are the senders and God continues to send people to go as far as the other side of the earth, but also God at the same time is calling God's people to send in the same way. And here we see in the book of Acts, Paul's dramatic escape from the city of Damascus. Now, if you have anything like me, you, you'll probably read these verses and go, wow, you know, Paul narrowly escaped with his life, didn't he? And how exciting and, and, uh, and um, uh, exciting and, and uh, and almost now biting this event is in the, in the scriptures. And so often we think about the Apostle Paul and uh, his dramatic escape. But oftentimes we don't think about those who held the rope. In verse 25 it says, Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in the basket. So this morning we're going to look at these rope holders. And the question and the challenge of the message today is who will hold the missionary rope. Who will hold the missionary rope? Now, three simple truths I'd like us to look at. First of all, notice that holding the rope that night for these disciples was a great privilege. Was a great privilege. Now, here in the book of Acts, um, think about it with me. 
How well do you think these disciples that helped Paul that night escape Damascus, how well do you think they knew the Apostle Paul? Did they know him very well? Do you think, here's another big question, how well do you think these disciples knew what God was going to do with the Apostle Paul in the future? Well, not very, not very much. This was at the beginning of the Apostle Paul's ministry. Uh, this was after his first uh, few years as a Christian. He was a young Christian, we could say. And, um, and he had not even begun uh, to fulfill his missionary calling to take the gospel to the Gentiles. That's where we are in Acts chapter number 9. Now think for a moment what God did with the Apostle Paul. How greatly God used him. Have a look in Acts chapter 9 verse 15. Ananias was one of the Lord's disciples and he was a bit nervous about receiving Saul of Tarsus, the one who was putting Christians to death. Now God encouraged Ananias to not be afraid in verse 15, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So there's the reminder for us this morning. God had a plan for the Apostle Paul. He was saved, he was baptized, and he, he was sent out as a missionary. He took the gospel before the kings of, uh, of the Jews. He took the gospel into Caesar's very own household. And we learn that souls were saved in Caesar's palace because of the Apostle Paul's witness. And it's no, it's no exaggeration to say it's because of the missionary, the Apostle Paul, that we have the gospel in Australia today. He took it to the Gentiles, England, America. Here we are in Australia. Amen? We ought to be thankful for missionaries. Now back to these disciples. How well did they know the Apostle Paul? Well, not very well. But think about it for a moment. One day in glory, when they died and they went to heaven, one day, how thankful do you think they would have been that this night in Acts chapter number 9, they had a hand in helping the missionary, the Apostle Paul, escaped with his life. How thankful do you think they were? Well, that's an understatement, don't you think? Looking back on what God used him for. Now, they only had a little hand in helping them, him escape, but it certainly made the difference. The Apostle Paul went on. He went on to do the will of God, and he went on to serve the Lord as a missionary. And so the encouragement for us this morning is to realize when it comes to our part in world missions, let's not lose sight of the fact that it is our great privilege. Amen? It is, a, it is our great privilege to be a part of partnering with missionaries. Now, you might say, Brother James, you're just talking about yourself. Don't worry, I, made, I had this message uh, uh, ready before I was a missionary. And, uh, and I just want to encourage you this morning to see it as a privilege to support the missionaries you already support. Amen? Don't ever lose sight of the privilege you have as a church to partner with missionaries on the field. Now, here's where it relates to us this morning. These disciples didn't know Paul very well. They didn't know what God would use him for. They couldn't see the future. Likewise, we're the same, aren't we? We support missionaries, and you may not know them very well. You may not have met some of them before. For some of you, they're just faces on a prayer card, on a prayer letter. Let's be honest, most of the people they ask for you to pray for are photos of people you've never met. Probably you will never meet on this side of eternity. Names of people you've never met. And yet you pray for them, don't you? Amen? You pray for them. And then you trust that God is at work and then you hear of souls saved. Can I encourage you with this truth that one day when we enter glory, then we will see the full picture of what God did on that mission field, how many souls were saved as a result of that ministry. And indeed, as Paul said, I desire not a gift, but that fruit may abound to your account. Your eternal account will be benefited 
by you partnering with missionaries. Don't allow the difficulty of not knowing what's happening there exactly, not knowing who that missionary is. Don't let that stop you from partnering with those missionaries, from holding the rope from here at Fellowship Baptist Church for the missionaries who are far away in a land you've never been to. Amen? Make sure you continue to see it as your privilege because one day you will see the fruit that will abound to your account. Like these disciples, I delight in that thought, like these disciples who entered glory and they thought, wow, look what God did through Paul. Amen? What a privilege. What a joy to be a part of God's work in however the, the way the Lord allows us to be. May we do that. Well, next I see not only was holding the rope their privilege, and it is ours also. Notice that uh, in verse 25, holding the rope is our duty, as it was theirs. Verse 25, then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. All right, I'm going to give you a trick question this morning. It's an easy one. Why did they not take Paul to the city gates and let him out through the front door? Why did they take him to a wall and with great difficulty lower him in a basket? Why would they do that? And you can say, say an answer out loud if you think you know the answer. That's right. Paul's life was in danger. We see in verse 23, if the Jews got their hands on Paul, what would they do to him? They would kill him. They would kill him. They believed that was their right under Jewish law. If they caught him, they would stone him or kill him straight away. And that's what they were going to do. Paul's life was in danger. Paul's life was in danger. Don't miss this, the, the, the reality of this escape. Now, just like many biblical cities, uh, many cities in, in, that, in Bible times, Damascus was surrounded by very high walls to protect it from, from enemy attacks. And so they took him to a wall. In fact, the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11 uh, tells us it was a window in the wall. Probably a bit bigger than that. And, uh, and so they let Paul down through a window in the wall. And Paul, in that account in 2 Corinthians 11, gives us a little bit more detail. Not only were the Jews trying to kill him, but the governor of Damascus was also in on the plot. And he had his soldiers searching for Paul and guarding the city gates. Here's my point. These disciples that night, whether or not they knew it was their privilege is beside the point. One day they did find out it was their privilege. But that night, I believe they knew it was their duty to help the apostle Paul escape. His life was in danger, wasn't it? How could these Christians sit back and do nothing while Paul, at this young Christian, needed a hand to help him escape from the city? Holding the rope that night was their duty. And likewise, may I encourage you that holding the rope is our duty as well. Now, imagine if the disciples took Paul to the window in the wall and said, Paul, look, people are looking, looking for you. We don't have much time. Here's a window. It's, a, it's quite a height. But God bless you, brother. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, let me lend you a hand. <laughs> Good one, brother. Let's lend you a hand. And, well, we trust God. You'll land on both feet, I'm sure. And... Uh, we trust everything will go well. God is with you. God bless you. And they walk off in the opposite direction and they go back to the safety of their homes. Imagine if the disciples did that that night. Now you would say, Brother James, that's ridiculous. Of course they wouldn't do that. Well, let me compare that to a similarity of what we do many times with our missionaries. We're thankful that they're going and not us. Sometimes we say that, don't we? And we, we say, God bless you, brother. We know God will be with you. God has called you, so God will be with you. And we even out of politeness, and I know I've done it. I'm, I'm in the same guilty basket. I, uh, I'll be praying for you, brother. Well, that's the polite thing we say among Christians, don't we? Sometimes we don't mean it. Sometimes we do. Thank the Lord. 
and we say, God bless you, brother. I'll be thinking of you. I'll be praying with you. And uh, we trust that everything will be fine. And it's almost as if we think that the missionary can just <coughs> jump for it and he'll land on his own two feet and he'll be fine. And we forget that if God has called them to go, we have a duty to hold the rope. Amen? We have a duty to partner with them. Just like those disciples that night helped Paul escape, we also have a duty to help our missionaries escape from danger. How do we do that? I'm glad you asked. Turn with me quickly, please, to the book of 2 Thessalonians. Are you still with me this morning? We're looking at our duty to help missionaries. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Just so you know, I'm not making this up and trying to impress upon you something that's unbiblical. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. It is our duty to help our missionaries escape from danger. Did you know that? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Let's read verses 1 and 2 out loud, shall we? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Ready? Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Well, there we have it. Paul's persecution didn't end with Damascus. It just was beginning. It was just getting started. Everywhere Paul went, they were after his life. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to get rid of him. They wanted to discredit him. Paul speaks in verse 2 of unreasonable and wicked men. What were they doing in verse 1? Have a look. They were getting in the way of the gospel. He was saying, pray for us that the gospel would have free course, like an arrow. There's one illustration, an arrow being shot out of a bow, hitting the target. That's what Paul was saying. Pray that the gospel will have free course. But what's happening? Wicked and evil men are getting in the way. They're trying to stop the preaching of the gospel. They're trying to stop souls being saved. In Paul's day, it was the Jews, also the Romans. In our day, it's the religious. Things haven't changed. And here is the divine word of God pleading to churches to hold the rope for missionaries who need you to help them escape from danger, from persecution. Now, how do you do that? What does the Bible say in verse 1? Finally, brethren, what's the next word? Pray for us. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever seen the connection there that as you pray, and this is the exciting thing about partnering with missionaries, as you pray for your missionaries. Now, I'm not just talking half-heartedly. I'm talking about holding the rope, amen? A commitment to missions. If you see it as your duty as a Christian, to pray for your missionaries, do you realize that the Bible teaches us God will grant deliverance from danger? That's what Paul understood. Why do you think he escaped time and time again with his life? Well, obviously, there were some Christians praying for him, amen? There were some Christians praying for him when he, when he almost died and he was stoned. There were some Christians praying for him when, when the Jews were after him in Jerusalem and he narrowly escaped with his life and off he went to Rome to take the gospel into Caesar's very palace. Wow. The miraculous ministry of the Apostle Paul was miraculous not because of Paul. He would tell you that himself. I am the chief of sinners, he said. It was miraculous because of the answered prayers of God's people who were doing what? Say it. In this little illustration, they were holding the rope. Church family, I hope you'll see it as your duty to hold the rope. As I've looked at the board briefly this morning as the missionaries are there, you know, missionaries in foreign countries, they minister in places that are dangerous. They don't have a Christian heritage most of the time. If they do, it's very quickly slipping away, like here in Australia. But for example, Mauritius, as you pray for the Sorets and for us, that's an island that did not begin with a Christian heritage. It now has a Hindu government. Imagine a government run by pagan Hindus. Imagine what kind of morals and, and uh, standards are in place. 
when the Hindu gods themselves are immoral and perverse and wicked. There is a demonic uh, 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 oppression upon the entire island. People walk around and you can see, as Brother Francois would tell you, they have darkened minds. Their minds have been affected spiritually by all the idol worship. Uh, sometimes in Australia we don't understand that. But when you talk to them, you can see that they're half not there. They're half not there. They've been, they've been uh, 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 giving themselves over to Satan. We know that. All their life, don't expect Satan to give up the ground he has gained easily. So persecution will come. Oppression will come. Pray for your missionaries that they'll escape the dangers, especially when they write and say, pray for us, we're in danger. In Papua New Guinea. Amen? Tribal warfare. Left and right. Any time can break out. And how narrowly many have escaped with their lives. What's the point? Churches were praying for them. Amen? Don't let go of the rope. Don't let go of the rope. See it as your duty. Not only as your privilege, but as your duty to support missionaries. Well, what happened to the Apostle Paul? As these disciples saw it as their duty. Verse 25. They let him down by the wall in a basket. He landed softly, amen. I love this picture. He landed softly on the ground and he went off to continue to do what God had called him to do. And brethren, as you pray for your missionaries, I trust that that will be the outcome. Amen. As you pray fervently, God will answer your prayers. You see, missions work is partnership. The senders and the goers are one. Hey, we, should, we ought not to think, and I hope you don't think that of us this morning, that somehow missionaries are more important to God than you are, are more valuable to God than you are here in Australia. Listen, missions work is... Missionaries are not more important. Missionaries are not more valuable. We work together, amen? We are laborers together with God. What a privilege we have. What a duty we have before us. Now, if we're serious, let me close with this last point. And this is for you that are serious about being a part of reaching the world through missions here at this local church. If you're serious, let's note one more lesson. Verse 25. Thank you for your attention. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. Now, why was it that they took him by night? The same reason they led him down by a wall. Not during the day, because Paul's life was in danger. They wanted to kill him. Here's a question. What would have happened to these disciples if they were caught that night? In Australia, we would call them accomplices in the act. What penalty do you think these disciples would have received if they were caught? You can speak to me this morning. That's right. Don't think they would have been lenient on the disciples when Paul's, when they had a death warrant out on the Apostle Paul and they were helping him to escape. What do we see, lastly, from the Scriptures? Let us be assured that these disciples were willing to sacrifice. They were willing to sacrifice. They put their lives on the line that night to help Paul escape. And this is our last principle. My friends, if we want to be a part of reaching the world for Jesus Christ, we can get excited about missions. Hey, we can even start to give a little bit to missions when it's missions conference time. You know, it's easy to get excited about missions. But there's a difference in getting excited and being willing to sacrifice. Wouldn't you agree? You see, holding the rope will cost something. That's the third point. It's our privilege. Absolutely, it's our duty. But if we're serious, it's going to cost us something. Paul already spoke in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 about prayer. And church family, let's be honest, prayer doesn't just happen. Have you ever tried to pray and realize it's hard work? I hope you have. It's hard work. I don't know about you, I get tired and I fall asleep easily, so I need to stand up and I need to work hard at staying attentive, keeping my focus on the Lord, 
keeping my focus on the needs of the missionary and the requests at hand and praying fervently in the Spirit of God for that need. Look, it takes hard work. And it doesn't just happen. We need to plan times of prayer. And if we're going to pray for missionaries, let's just be awfully practical. If we're going to hold the rope seriously, well, we need to know what to pray for. Isn't that true? Listen, Lord, please bless the missionary. That's not going to cut it. I've done that a lot. I'll put myself in the same basket again. I've done that a lot. I'm not here to make you feel bad. Amen. Let's be encouraged to hold the rope. Listen, sometimes we just pray, Lord, bless the missionary. Lord, help them with what they need. And listen, they've written a letter to tell you what they need. Amen. They've written a letter to tell you who to pray for for salvation. They've written a letter or an urgent message to say, this is, the, this is the danger we're in. We need to pray specifically. That means we have to write it down on a notepad. Hey, we need to put it on a board at home. We need to have their prayer cards available at home. Whatever it takes, it's going to take sacrifice, time, energy and effort to hold the rope. Some of you who went to youth camp recently, imagine if you're playing tug of war and your team didn't, didn't put any effort in. You know, maybe you were on a tug of war team like that before and the other team won because the other team wasn't, because your team wasn't pulling or you didn't have the biggest guy at the end of the rope at the end uh, pulling his weight. Listen, holding the rope takes sacrifice. It takes effort. We have to be willing to put in that effort. The sacrifice of prayer Matthew 17, verse 21, the Lord Jesus said this, How be it, this kind cometh not out, but by prayer and fasting. If you look at that passage, we don't have time this morning, what was, what was taking place was demonic activity. A young boy was possessed by a demon. Hey, what better picture, what better situation to picture missions? We have demon-possessed people everywhere around the world, darkened minds because of idolatry, missionaries going in to preach the gospel. Prayer is essential, but fasting is also necessary. And that will require sacrifice. I mean, how many of us like to skip a meal at any time, let alone to sacrifice that time to pray? I don't know about you, but I get hungry. And when I get hungry, I get even more tired. And so if we're going to uh, uh, obey the word of God and fast and pray for our missionaries, listen, it's going to take effort again. I hope you see this morning that holding the rope isn't just getting excited about missions. It's more than just a, a feeling. It's a commitment, a willingness to sacrifice like these disciples did that night, to pray to fast. And lastly, Philippians chapter 4, and this is the last scripture we'll turn to. Philippians chapter 4. Notice Paul spoke of a sacrifice here in uh, the book of Philippians. Holding the rope will cost something. Sacrificial prayer, sacrificial fasting. Notice verses Verse 18 of Philippians chapter 4. Paul says, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a, what's the next word? Sacrifice, can you see it? Acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Well, there we go. As Paul went off to do what God had called him to do, there were believers like here in Philippi that helped Paul on his way. They gave, Paul benefited, and he said in verse 18, I have all and abound, I am full. He said, I've received what you have given, but don't miss it, brethren. What you have given is an odor of a sweet smell, just like incense wafting up before the very throne of God in heaven, before the very nostrils of God, if you will, as a sweet savor. That's how they're giving smelt to God. It was sweet. It was pleasant. And even more so, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. Do you see that? So giving 
is a sacrifice. If we are going to hold the rope and partner with missionaries, we must pray, we must fast, but we must also give to help them go, to help them to stay. But it will require sacrifice. Any serious giving requires sacrifice. Well, that's what the Lord Jesus said when the woman at the temple gave in her one might. Obviously, this is a much longer message, but I won't go in detail. But she gave all that she had. And the Lord noted her offering. Why? Simply because she sacrificed. Did that mean she had nothing to live off? No. God provides all our needs. Amen. And God provided her needs that day also. But she gave all that she had. Rather than that, with the, the, the Pharisee, who out of his abundance, gave a small amount. It didn't require sacrifice. So when it comes to giving to missions, we must understand it will require sacrifice. Giving to missions ought to stretch our faith. It ought to cause us to be uncomfortable. Lord, if I give what you want me to give, of course, Lord, I'm going to have to trust you with my finances for the year ahead. Amen? Hey, listen. Disciples put their life on the line. They were willing to sacrifice. How about you and I? Are we willing to give sacrificially? Amen? So more missionaries can be supported. So the missionaries you currently support can continue to minister. This is what the Word of God says. Well-pleasing to God. It will cost something. And there will be times in your giving when you're holding the rope you're giving faithfully, and suddenly you feel the rope burns. Amen? Do you know what that means? I've lost my job. What am I going to do now? How am I going to continue to give to missions? And we start to feel those rope burns, don't we? And suddenly we're in a position where either we let go of the rope, or by faith we say, Lord, Help me to trust you now in this time of testing. What a sad indictment upon the Christian who, when financial times get tough, crosses off the spiritual things first. Amen? What a sad indictment. It ought to be the other way around. Lord, I'll cut back the costs on the chocolate bars and the, you know. Hey, listen, our dog ought ought not to get more money spent on it than the missionaries. Amen? Our pets, hope you don't mind being being honest, nothing wrong with having a dog. But listen, we have to get our perspective back in order. If missions work is teamwork, are we holding our weight? Our privilege, our duty, and it will cost something. But the rewards will be eternal. Our rewards will be eternal. And I believe the greatest tragedy among missions work today is when believers in local churches start to let go of the rope. If the disciples let go of that rope that night, can I ask simply this horrible question, what would have happened to the Apostle Paul? Anything good? No. Let us see partnership with missionaries the same way. Amen? Listen, if a missionary falls... Let's remember the rope holders. Amen? We need to hold the rope. Praise God for that joy, that privilege. If you are holding a rope, let me encourage you to hold on tighter this year. Don't let go. Amen? Hold the rope. Be there for the missionary. You're a partner with them. The fruit that they experience in their ministry, Paul said... In the same passage of Scripture there in Philippians chapter 4, it will abound to your account. You will see the fruit and the reward of your laboring together with them in eternity. That is exciting. That is eternal. Amen? That is what God wants to bless us with in the future. But so easy to lose sight of it when our missionaries are so far away. Trust God has spoken to you this morning. Pastor will come and close.
and uh, thank you for the privilege of presenting the ministry and sharing the word. Thank you, Pastor.